morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earth and Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. Glory be to God for another day in which we can learn of God and learn what pleases him from his holy word. And for those of you who speak English, the King James Version of the Holy Bible is the word of God. And when we want to understand the truth, that's where we get it. Today is April 1st, 2021. And many religious people who believe themselves to be Christians in a few days will be partaking of a religious ritual that is an abomination before God. And that's called the Easter Festival. Easter is something that is written of in the scripture. And we want to understand what the scripture says about it. Just noticing that the word Easter is in the Bible and then saying, see, the word Easter is in the Bible. That means it's a good idea if I do it. It's foolishness. That's foolishness. We read the word of God and we understand what is written. We don't just look for a word and then construct a belief system and a religious practice around it. So in Acts chapter 12, and may the Lord bless the reading of his word today, Let's begin in verse 1. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex the church. So vex means to trouble. King Herod was not a friend of Christians, obviously. Verse 2, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, so it pleased the religious authorities, who had just murdered Jesus Christ not long ago. It pleased them that he murdered James, the brother of John. And now he sees Peter. It says, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then in parentheses we read, then were the days of unleavened bread. So this parenthetical statement is telling us the time of year that it took place, that the Jewish people we're celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Verse 4, And when he had apprehended him, Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, of course, Herod was not going to bring forth Peter to the people so that he could testify unto them of their Messiah and the resurrected Son of God. He was going to bring Peter forth the way Jesus Christ had been brought forth to be murdered before the people. That was his intention. And he was going to wait until the festival of Easter was over with before he did this. Now, I want to talk about the Herodians for just a moment. The Herodians were a political party that were made up of Jewish people who were answerable to the emperor of Rome. When we consider the, the Whore of Babylon, written of in Revelation 17, verse 3 through 5, we read of a religious system that controls the kings of the earth. So the whore rides the beast, the beast being the governments of the world, and this beast has many heads. The Roman whore, the Roman religion, is what rules the world, and the Pope of Rome is the Emperor of Rome in our time. He is both a re religious authority and a government authority, and all the kings of the world answer unto him. It's the practice of Rome to appoint kings in the earth that are taken from the people of that area that they rule over. So, for example... The Pope of Rome appoints a president over the United States that is commonly taken from the population of the United States in order to give that king some kind of legitimacy. It doesn't look then like an outside force is, is ruling over the people and is against the interests of the people. The pretense that somehow the authority is given by the people is done in order to retain control, but it's an illusion and not real. 
Similarly, the Herodians were appointed by Rome to rule over the people of Judea, and they were Jewish men, but they did not worship according to the, um, the law of God. They were not practicing Jews. They were beholden to Rome. They got privileges and power from Rome, and they worshiped the gods of Rome. Now, we know that in the Old Testament, it's very clear that oftentimes the kings of Israel and Judea or Jerusalem, that, that they worshipped the, the gods of the Canaanites around them, the Canaanite religion. The Canaanite religion, as did the Babylonian religion, the Egyptian religion, the religion of India, uh, the religions of all the world originated in Babylon at the time of Nimrod. In Genesis chapter 11, we read about this Tower of Babel. And let's just read this very quickly so you can see that I'm talking from the Word of God and not off the top of my head. So in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, we read, And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, unless we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So the people of the earth were worshiping the host of heaven at this time. They wanted to get to heaven. They wanted to build a way to get to heaven without obeying God. So it was a vain form of religion. This was when Nimrod was king of Babylon. So Nimrod and his wife Semiramis represented themselves to the people of the world as being the sun god and the moon goddess. And when Nimrod was killed, Semiramis, his wife, used witchcraft, an operation of witchcraft, to inseminate herself, allegedly. This is their myth. I'm not saying it's true, but this is their myth. Inseminate herself with the spirit of the sun god, and she brought forth the reincarnated sun god to Moose. So this was the religion that was practiced in the time when the Tower of Babel was brought forward. We see that they had two parts to them. They had the, the religious authority and the temporal authority. The religious authority was the real power, but there was also a desire to have global power. So we read here, Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So they wanted a name, and they wanted global power. They wanted a name other than the name of God. They wanted to worship the host of heaven. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this thing they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So when this happened, the people were scattered all over the face of the earth, and the languages were confounded. So what happened was the gods that they worshipped now had different names because the languages had been confused. So the people in India call their trinity, their god, something else, other names. So I want to just briefly go over part of this mythology for you that we see written in, in the doctrines of Egypt. So Isis, which was the name of Semiramis, or the moon goddess in Egypt, was married to Osiris. And when Osiris was killed, his body was dismembered into 14 pieces, according to their myth. And then what she did, Isis, this moon goddess woman, that she assembled together all the parts of her husband's body, but there was a piece missing. And the piece that was missing was his male member, because that male member, when it had been broken off or cut off or what have you, had landed in the Nile River and the fish had eaten it. So she used witchcraft to form for herself an obelisk. And an obelisk is seen, you know, in the Vatican. There's one in the Vatican. There's one in Washington, D.C. There's one in London. So this obelisk is also found in many uh, cemeteries and so forth. It's a symbol of reincarnation. So 
What Isis did was she used witchcraft to assemble for herself a phallus so she could inseminate herself with the spirit of the sun god. And then she claimed that the baby she brought forth to Moose was the reincarnated sun god. And his birthday, of course, is December 25th, when the sun emerges from its lowest point in the sky. So it's sun worship. That's what it is. The birthday of Tammuz is December 25th. Well, the day that she inseminated herself using witchcraft is the day when people celebrate the, the fertility god, goddess with things like eggs and rabbits. And this goddess has many names throughout the world. Things like in the Greek religion was Aphrodite. In the Roman religion was Venus. In the Babylonian or Assyrian religion, it was Ishtar. In the Bible, she is referred to as Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth was the moon goddess of the Phoenicians, and she was married to Baal, the sun god. And in the Bible, we read about women weeping for Tammuz. When we're reading about this, what we're reading about is people in Israel worshiping the host of heaven. Let's go now to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And here Stephen uh, is speaking to the people of Israel about their history and their history of idolatry. And it's right before, of course, they stone him to death. In verse 43, we read the words of Stephen. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So people in pagan religions use figures and symbols. So in particular, the star of your god Remphan is a figure that picture, it's a picture, a symbol that that people of different lands can look at and understand what the meaning of it is. So the star of your god, Remphan, is when you have a triangle or a pyramid pointing up and a pyramid pointing down, and they're joined together. And this is a picture of the, the sun god coming in to the womb of the mother goddess and bringing forth the reincarnated sun god, to moons or Lucifer, Lucifer. In the Vedic texts, we read that God can be understood as a cosmic egg. And the concept of the egg, of course, it's a female image. And it's the basic idea, the way that they describe it, is that the spirit is contained, the life is contained in the egg. And that when the egg is broken, it's a picture of death. And so the egg is a picture of birth, death, and reincarnation. When Trinitarians say, well, if you want to understand God, here's an egg. And you, you can understand that God has three persons because an egg has three parts that are all egg. So the shell is egg, the yolk is egg, and the white is egg. And so it is, they say, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are separate, but equal, but all egg. They all have the same godness. The oneness Pentecostals will tell you that God the Father inserted himself into the womb of the Virgin Mary and that she was the mother of God, and she brought forth God in a sonship role. But see, all of these terms and pictures and images and diagrams that people make for you have nothing to do with what the scripture says about who God is. They are figures. They are figures. They are things that, that heathen people construct in order to explain to people who God is. But we who are Christians believe what Jesus said. And Jesus said that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
So let's get it from the Word of God. Let's get our understanding from the Word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So Jesus said that God is a spirit. And here we're getting a detailed description of what that means. He's the King eternal. So he has no beginning, no end. He is the I am. He's immortal. He cannot die. He's invisible. He cannot be seen. He is the only wise God. To, uh, to under him, unto him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So now Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, verse 21. We'll start in the middle of the passage. And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. So God is our Savior. Does that mean that the Son of God is God himself? Well, let's understand what Jesus Christ said about himself. And not make things up and not use words and phrases that are not found in the scripture that depart from the truth. John chapter 14, Jesus Christ is having a conversation with his disciples. Let's begin in verse 6. Jesus is answering Thomas here. He says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the way that we approach the Father is by Jesus Christ. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long a time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So did Jesus Christ say that, he, did he say, I am the Father? No. Did he say, I'm God the Son? No. He said that the Father dwelled in him. And that when you looked at him, you saw the Father because the Father, who is invisible and immortal, was in him. The Spirit of God was manifest in the Son of God. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Not the, that God, that God, inserted himself into the womb of a virgin and took on a flesh suit. Not that God sent another deity beside him, God the Son, into the womb of the virgin, and that the mother goddess then brought forth God. You see? Because Mary was the mother of the only begotten Son of God. She wasn't the mother of God. Mary did not bring forth God in a sonship role. Mary did not bring forth God the Son. The scripture saith Mary brought forth the only begotten Son of God, and that Son was in her by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, we read, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of 
the Holy Ghost. So Mary became pregnant when she was yet a virgin by the Holy Ghost. So the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is God, because God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So there aren't three persons to a Godhead. There is a Godhead that was fully in the Son of God. In him, in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when Trinitarians make a diagram for you, and it's a triangle, and there's God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they say they're all God, they're all equally God, they're completely separate, but but um, they're, they're all one God, it, it, that's nonsense. When they say to you, God is like an egg, God is like an egg, that's pagan nonsense. And the practice of celebrating the insemination of the moon goddess with the phallus of witchcraft to bring forth the reincarnated sun god is something that we as Christians wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. We don't color Easter eggs. We don't go on Easter egg hunts. We don't send Easter cards. And we don't, we don't do things that celebrate fertility. Things like bunny rabbits and chicks and stuff. We don't do that. And the reason why is because to do those things is to partake of the worship practices of the heathen, which God forbids. All of those things are an abomination before God. If you want to be a Christian, the way to become a Christian is first to understand who God is. That God said from the beginning that he would send his only begotten son into the world to redeem mankind from the power of darkness. The way that this happens is we recognize that Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, because God was his father, was a man who was without sin. And he obediently went to the cross and shed his innocent blood, that those who are buried with him in baptism, who are covered by his blood, could share in newness of life with him and inherit the everlasting kingdom. The way we are baptized is we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then like Jesus Christ was, we are filled with the spirit of the living God. When this happens, we speak with an unknown tongue and glorify God in a language we never learned. When this happens, we are given power to testify unto the world about the truth. And the whole world has generally worshipped the host of heaven, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, and they give them different names and they do different things in their rituals. And we who worship God, worship him in spirit and in truth. And not only do we depart from such things, we abhor such things. And we tell the truth about such things so that those who are able to hear the word of God can come out from Babylon and worship God in spirit and in truth, can be saved from their sins, and serve the living God until Jesus Christ comes to take the throne. People who are worshiping Baal, who are worshiping a trinity or a oneness, don't know God. And when Jesus Christ comes to return, when he returns, he's going to look at these people and he's going to say, why were you doing these things? Because you had my word. You had my word. You could have known me and you didn't bother. You'd rather listen to the flattering words of religious authorities than obey me. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I pray this message is clarified for those of you who have wondered about it, about the practice of Easter eggs and Easter egg hunts and so forth. The idea that God is a oneness or a trinity, where these things come from is Babylon. And it's the worship of the host of heaven. It has nothing to do with 
worshipping the true God, the only true God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and serving Jesus Christ in holiness. So I want to close now with the word of the Lord so you can see from the word of God that what I've just told you is true. And there is nothing that we would add to it. There is nothing we would take away from it. Jesus Christ, he had just been resurrected and he encountered Mary. And he said to her in verse 17, John chapter 20, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. You know, the father, the only true God. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and to your father. I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. The only begotten Son of God was crucified by the religious people of his time, the Pharisees and the Herodians, the people who served Rome and wanted the things of this world, crucified their Messiah. And he bled to death on a cross. He suffered and died for mankind's sin. And then he was buried and he was resurrected on the third day. When he was resurrected, he encountered Mary and he said to her, Don't touch me, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and tell them that I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. There is one God and Father of all and one Lord Jesus Christ. And the way unto the Father is by Jesus Christ. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, he said. So that means that we obey his gospel and we walk thereafter in holiness. We show our love for Jesus Christ by repenting of our sin, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, being filled with his Holy Spirit, and thereafter serving the everlasting King. I pray this message has been a blessing to you. Feel free to email me if you like or to comment in the comments section below. And may the word of the Lord go forth today and draw many out of the darkness of Babylon and into the marvelous light of truth as it is written for us in God's holy and perfect word. Amen.